All right, Alexander, let's talk about the situation in Ukraine, and maybe we can start with what is going on on the front lines, and then we can talk some some geopolitics, maybe dig into this Trump uh, peace plan or this peace plan that was given to Trump from Kellogg and... uh, Flights, I believe, is his, his Points, name. Yeah. yeah, Reuters reported on it, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about what, what is the fake news in and around Korea sending uh, engineer, an engineering unit to Ukraine. From what I understand, this was started by South Korea. Anyway, uh, let's let's start. What what do you want to start off with? The front lines? Or? Well, let's let's talk about the military situation now. As a, as we've been discussing in many programs now, uh, the Russians are advancing. On, right across the front lines, they um, suddenly and completely unexpectedly, but this is now becoming the, the pattern. They opened up um, a, a new advance towards a town, important town, a uh, town of about thirty thousand people, one of the main linchpins of the Ukrainian uh, defense lines, a place called Toretsk, and they suddenly attacked Toretsk. The Ukrainians had thought that this was a quiet line quiet place on the battlefronts, so they'd withdrawn most of the troops that had been um, defending or had been charged with defending Toretsk. The result was that when the Russians did attack, the place was not as fully garrisoned as it needed to be. The Russians were able to make very rapid progress, captured an awful lot of the fortifications and positions around Toretsk very quickly. Um, Things have calmed a bit because the Ukrainians have rushed troops back. But it's the story that we see right across the front lines. The Russians hold the initiative. They attack wherever wherever they want, whenever they want. They steadily capture more and more territory. They have apparently reduced control by the Ukrainians of the uh, micro district in Chasofya, which it turns out is the most heavily fortified part of Chasofya, to just seven buildings. These are high rise buildings, so it's not, you know, we're not talking about small buildings, we're talking about big ones, but it looks like the battle there is close to completion. They are um, closing in. In fact, they practically reached a road that lies between the city, a town called Pakrovsk in the west and uh, Chasofyar in the east, which is apparently a major road. They're gradually closing, uh, um, you know, encircling two important fortified Ukrainian towns, Siversk in the north and Vuglidar in the south. But for me, the big story over the last couple of weeks is the terrible casualties that the Russians claim the Ukrainians are suffering. And now we've reached a situation where um, the Ukrainians are losing men at the rate of about 2,000 to 2,000 a day. Now, we discussed a short time ago that Ukraine is suffering losses faster than it can replace them. If it continues to lose men at the rate of 2,000 a day, then it is going to lose 60,000 men in a month. Now, the Ukrainians have rushed out the claim that they're mobilizing 5,000 men every day. I don't believe that claim, by the way, but that's what they say. I think the reason they've released that is because, in effect, they're admitting that these Russian casualty figures are essentially correct. And it gives us a sense of how fast and how rapidly their forces are becoming depleted. And so they want to foster the idea that despite everything, their army is growing in size when all of the evidence shows that it's shrinking. Which is which is why all the weapons make no difference, which is why all the weapons make no difference and can cannot make any difference. And of course, the Russians uh, have still not committed their major reserves. I, I, we've again discussed this in a recent program, but uh, my sense is that there's perhaps 300,000 Russian troops fighting on the front lines. 
Ukrainian forces are about the same in number, perhaps a little less, but there's about 400,000 Russian troops, in other words, at least as many, perhaps more Russian troops still in reserves, the big, heavy, mechanized units still not being committed to the battle. And in the meantime, um, you're talking about weapons, the way the fact that Ukrainian weapons cannot make any difference. Over the last couple of days, the Russians have unveiled a new weapon, the FAB 3000, and apparently its effects are devastating. And I've been having a lot of people explain to me what it is doing. It's an enormous bomb. It weighs three tons. It can be carried by tactical aircraft. It's the kind of, uh, uh, it's apparently the heaviest bomb that a tactical aircraft carries anywhere in the world. The big strategic bombers are able to carry even heavier bombs. But basically, the purpose of this bomb is that it's a fortification buster. It can destroy the most heavily fortified positions. The blast wave kills any soldiers that are inside those positions. So it is devastating in terms of the casualties that it can cause. And it can also be used to target civilian infrastructure that's being used for military purposes like uh, bridges, you know, the big bridges across the Dnieper, uh, the major railway hubs, the railway stations and places like that. You drop one of these things on one of those. And as I said, the results are, are, are terrible. And we now have lots of film <laughs> of these FAB 3000s being used on the front lines, and the effect is devastating. And the Ukrainians seem to have tried to respond to this by again uh, deploying their Patriot missile systems close to the front lines. There was a very strange report by the Russian Defense Ministry, which people seem to have missed, that the Russians have succeeded in shooting down um, Patriot air defense missiles after launch. I wonder whether that means that they are, that, you know, that this was, that they're being positioned so close to the front lines that the Russians are able to shoot down these missiles as they try to attack Russian aerial targets. It has been suggested that this was a mistake and that when the Russians referred to Patriot missiles, they really meant at at Atakam's missiles. But I get the sense that these Russian defense ministry reports are very, very care carefully edited, and that looks to me unlikely. How is Ukraine doing on the mobilization side of things? There was a well, lot of talk on mobilization months ago, a lot of talk, a lot of hype, a lot of uh, reports on Ukraine's mobilization from the collective West media and from um, Zelensky's administration. Not much talk about it anymore. What's yeah, going because, on there? Well, I mean, they, they're claiming that they're mobilizing 5,000 men a day. But I don't, to be frank, I don't believe that. I, I, I think that is, um, I think that's an absurd figure. As I said, I think it was released because they wanted to show that they're mobilizing twice as many men as they're losing. I think that was really what that, that was all about. Um, what I am seeing is, yes, they are mobilizing quite a lot of people. Those people are being sent into battle with just a few weeks training. Um, many of them are. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about the very young people who are being mobilized. But it looks like increasingly they're being mobilizing men in their 60s. It, 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 it's really not going at all well. That's my own sense of this. and. Um, these are old men being sent to fight without much training. Many of them apparently are refusing orders to attack. There have been reports, including from some existing previous Ukrainian military units, that more and more battalions and brigades are just refusing to be sent uh, to attack into battle um, when they receive orders to, to attack. And uh, it, it, it all looks very sad. And 
perhaps reflecting this and the dissension in the Ukrainian army. There's reports now that General Sirsky, who took over from General Zaluzhny a few weeks ago, that his job is now on the line, that he might also be sacked before long. And one of his um, uh, major um, allies within the military, another general called Sodol, he's also just been sacked after being criticized by the Azov Brigade. They said that this general had killed more Ukrainian soldiers than any Russian general had done, which um, <laughs> makes it seem as if more and more Ukrainian uh, soldiers are losing faith in their high command. Yeah, so th this story from uh, from Ukraine media, actually, because they picked this up and they uh, and they amplified it, uh, about North Korea sending uh, engineering uh, specialists and troops to, to Ukraine to help out Russia. Uh, this originated from um, a journalist, uh, a South Korean journalist, actually, and it's I think it's already been been pretty much debunked. But um, you, you know, you take these reports that that it's these these stories that are getting amplified that it's Russia that needs help of North Korea. So, so they, they need the North Korean weapons and the artillery and, and the troops. And then you get stories about uh, Ukraine mobilizing 5,000 men a day. I mean, what's the purpose of, of these types of, of narrative constructions from, from the Zelensky regime? I mean, is, is this all about more money and more weapons and keeping the collective West invested in the conflict of Ukraine, which means that Zelensky, in his mind, gets to remain in, in power? Um, another another couple months more, or, or what's going on here? Right, right. On, on, on this particular story, I think the first thing to say is that we should be anybody who follows Korean news should be extremely careful about accepting any report about North Korea that comes from South Korea. Now, so South Korea has. I mean, I visit. I visited South Korea. It's a very vibrant, very prosperous country. There's a lot of good things to be said about it, but the um, media information that comes out of South Korea about North Korea, it, it, it's very clear to me, is tightly controlled, not by the South Korean government, but it basically is controlled by the intelligence agencies in South Korea, which essentially are... Um, a local branch of the intelligence agencies of the United States. I've seen many claims that come out of South Korea about North Korea that are true. They've reported people in North Korea, top, lead, top officials in North Korea, who've been executed. And then they turn up a few months later at the side of Kim Jong-un, alive and well. So you should never pay any attention to this kind of thing. This story about the engineering unit being sent from South, from North Korea to Russia, it's exactly, um, it's in purpose, is exactly the one that uh, you <laughs> imply. It's to basically show that the Russians are on the ropes, that they're running out of weapons, that they are running out of men, that they need top people. So they're hunting everywhere to find people and to find weapons to continue the war. So they're going to North Korea to do it. And yes, probably, possibly the Russians are importing large numbers of shells from North Korea, which has a massive ability to produce shells. But um, it's inconceivable that they're importing, that they're asking the North Koreans to send engineering troops because the North Koreans wouldn't send them anyway, because I understand that that's against their policies and the Russians don't need them. They have huge numbers of highly qualified engineers and engineering troops and engineering construction troops. They built the Surovikin line right across the front lines in just a few weeks, they don't need troops from North Korea. Yeah, good point. Very good point. So this brings us to another piece of, of misinformation. I consider it misinformation from Reuters because they wanted to imply with this uh, report uh, about a, a, a Trump ceasefire in, uh, in Ukraine, that this was uh, a, a Trump type of plan or that Trump has signed on to, to this plan. But when you dig into the story from Reuters, you, you uncover that this was two former Trump 
uh, foreign policy uh, national security advisors, Kellogg, Kellogg and, uh, and Flights. And uh, they, they put together this think tank policy paper is the best way I can describe it about how they believe uh, a ceasefire could work in Ukraine. And they gave it to the Trump team. And we had statements from the Trump team saying, we're, we're looking at the plan. Trump looked it over. He seemed to, to be positive about it or he was okay about it. But no official statement from Trump or one of Trump's uh, close advisors saying that this is the plan that we're going to go with if I'm elected president. It was it was a paper, a foreign policy paper about a ceasefire from two former Trump advisors presented to Trump. And uh, and Trump is is looking it over, as I'm sure he's he's looking over many ideas. Uh, but uh, the, the ceasefire itself was, was laughable with. If, if you go through the the points of of the ceasefire plan uh, constructed by Kellogg and Flights, so what are your thoughts on this whole this whole story that that Reuters broke uh, a couple of days ago? Right now, now about Reuters, um, I, I should say that just as one should be extremely careful about anything about North Korea that is published in South Korea, I'm afraid you should be very equally careful about anything about the Ukraine war or indeed Russian politics that's published by Reuters. One way or the other, in some through some means or other, Reuters follows very, very closely to the orthodox political line of the British authorities. It's a British news agency. So it's going to take a very, very British line on events in Ukraine. So be very careful. I mean, Reuters can be interesting and useful, and they can sometimes provide some interesting information um, about you know, the situation on the battlefront from time to time. But always, you must always take what they say with a great deal of scepticism. Now, about this plan, you're absolutely right. It's not a Trump plan. It's not a Trump plan commissioned by Donald Trump. It's basically another plan repackaging this uh, freeze of the conflict, this proposal that's been floating around now for well over a year, by the way. I first started to hear about it around April of, April of 2023, before... Ukraine began its great offensive, the one in the summer, which eventually failed. And the people who have been pushing it, pushing it relentlessly, are people like Richard Haas at the Council for Foreign Relations. They floated it to the Russians many times, and they're trying to float it this time to the Trump, to Trump, hoping that perhaps a Trump administration will officially adopt it as U.S. policy. It won't fly. I've been trying to explain this now for, well, ever since this plan was first floated. I mean, what it basically says is we freeze everything on the existing front lines. Russia remains in de facto control of what it has. Ukraine retains uh, all of the rest of its territory. We enter into no long-term binding commitments about Ukraine. So Ukraine one day can join NATO, maybe not immediately, but fairly, you know, at some point in the future. We can rearm Ukraine to the full extent that we wish. We can refuse to accept what the Russians have done, and we prepare for the next war. Now, this is the same plan that this plan, the Kellogg plan, is. It's just a repackaging of that plan so that he can be presented to Donald Trump. There is nothing in this plan that the Russians would be interested in. Uh, they have already rejected it many, many times, but there's been endless attempts to try to get it f fly to fly. You remember a couple of months ago, there was even an attempt to try to suggest that Zeluzhny and Gerasimov were actually negotiating with each other <laughs> for, you know, a, a, a freeze. And Seymour Hirsch was roped in to publish an article um, which basically said that, even though obviously that wasn't true. So th this, is, this, is, this is the plan that's been repackaged. Reuters tells us, or wants to imply to us that it's the Trump plan it's not the Trump plan. I hope Donald Trump, if he becomes president, uh, is going to listen to people who have a more realistic understanding of the situation 
and under will understand that yes, the war does have to be brought to an end, but that it can't be continued, can't be brought to an end in this way. Yeah, that's my final thought. Is is what you just said as well, which which is that wh whether you're looking at that the, the the Democrats, the Republicans, um, the neocons, uh, people like uh, like like Haas or Kellogg, these guys, they don't really have any understanding of what Russia no. Russia wants or what they they've been saying. It seems like they haven't been listening. To no. any of the statements that Putin has been making over the past month or over the past year, for that matter, I just find it really, really shocking, really hard to believe that that they're still to this day coming out with these types of freeze plans. They're, they're yeah, not I mean, listening at all. They're not listening at all. Uh, I remember, again, a couple of months ago, we discussed an article that had appeared in Moscow Times, of all places, a tiny little newspaper published in the Netherlands. Now, it's not, it's not based in Moscow at all, but there was one of these people who'd just been to Moscow. He came back and he was so angry about the fact that the Russians weren't interested in the freeze plan that he was saying, you know, we, what we've got to do is get rid of Putin. <laughs> we've got to get rid of Putin so that we can implement the freeze plan. I mean, it was, it was, it, they're, they're not listening. They continue to obsess that it's Putin who's somehow standing in the way of the, ex, of acceptance of this plan. And, uh, but they're sold on it. They, they completely bought into it. I think at some level they generally believe that the, that the Russians will buy it, that this will be the plan that in the end is going to be implemented, which, I mean, they're completely wrong about. I think Donald Trump hopefully will understand that if he's elected. Um, however this war ends, it's not going to end with this plan. Agreed. All right, we will end the video there, the Duran.locks.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Use the code FOOTBALL24. The link is in the description box down below. Take care.